We now come to session 15, the last and final uh, of the sessions and the final chapter of my book. All of these sessions can be found in my book, For God's Sake, Rest, Discovering the Pleasure of God's Rest. And so if you have a copy, if you want to order a copy, you may do so, and this information will may be made available to you on the video. It's been my pleasure to present these, and I wish I could see every person out there and know you personally. And actually, if possible, I would like to hear every situation. Forgiveness, if those be the issues that you have, rest, struggles, but obviously I can't do that. So my hope is that God can in some way use these writings, these lectures in your life for God's sake because that's what life is all about. It's about Him, not ourselves. Now as we begin this final chapter, I want to talk about revival. You might say, well, how can solitude or solitary rest closest with God have anything to do with revival? In fact, it has much to do with revival. I believe that solitude, getting our orders from God, is the key to ultimate revival worldwide. We are drained, we are dysfunctional as a church because, largely because, we have not been at the feet of the Lord on a regular basis. We've neglected something called Sabbath rest. Whether you agree with me or not, I hope at least I've made some impact upon your thinking that I might nudge you a bit in that direction. And some of you will find true, according to scriptures, what we've been talking about, the necessity to travel from solitude to uh, public life, private to public, and back again on a regular basis in a rhythm called Sabbath, Sabbath rest, working diligently for five to six days, whatever it be, and then having solitude. And what we promote is three to four hours of solitude every week where you concentrate in silence and quietness at the Lord's feet and allow Him to speak to you and allow Him to get into your life and transform it. Speaking of transformation, there is something that we have to deal with in every life. Each life, I believe, has experienced or has at least a tinge of something called rebellion. And in this final chapter, we're going to come to the powerful words of the prophet Isaiah as he spoke to the Assyrians, or rather to the uh, northern kingdom about Assyria that was about to attack. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15 says, This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and in trust is your strength. But sadly, you would have none of it. Let's look at the Israelites at this particular time. At the beginning of this chapter, he, Isaiah calls them obstinate children. Woe to the obstinate children. And then in verse 9 of the same chapter, these are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. Yet they say, rebel? How oh, have we rebelled? We think we've kept the commandments. We've fasted. We have observed the Sabbath. We have done other things. We're obedient little children. Why, Isaiah, do you call us rebels, rebelling? And rebellion can be in very subtle, quiet ways just shifts in our thinking, exchanging God's principles for those which are common in our day and age, pressured by society. Now, there's the Assyrian captivity and how it took place. The Assyrians were coming upon Israel, and they were pressing upon them, and they wanted to take over the people, God's people, in that kingdom, in the north and somewhat in the south. And God's people had a choice. They could 
trust God or they could trust men. And they leaned upon Egypt as Egypt had always been kind of a safety zone for the people of God. It was there way back in history that Abraham went when there was a great need in Pharaoh, uh, a, a great need and, and hunger. And even before that, you find uh, that Joseph in captivity went there and there was then the Exodus 400 years later. But it was famine that drew the people to Egypt. And so it was somewhat of a safety zone. And the Assyrians, or I should say the Egyptians had strength. Of course, there, there were the pyramids that showed the days in which the pharaohs made great agricultural accomplishments that are amazing to this day. And then they were horsemen. And then they were an established, sophisticated people. So why not lean on the Egyptians to protect you from the powerful Assyrians? Rebellion happens as we exchange the promises of God for the plans of man. The Israelites had a plan. It was to rest on the accomplishments of Egypt and not on the promises of God. I'll ask Lois to read this segment and several segments of the book of Isaiah, chapter 30. Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. And there we have it, the plans as I've underscored it here. The plans that are not mine. When we have a problem, where do we go, first of all? Do we look to the promises of God and open the scriptures? What has God promised in the past to his people? Well, we read such passages as Hebrews chapter 13. Be not afraid. I've promised to be with you in all circumstances. Don't be covetous and don't be... Uh, envious of others. Other promises, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Or do we get on a phone, our cell phone, or make an email and writing a friend, what should I do, what should I do? I've got this problem. Where do we turn first of all? Do we take that time to remember Remember God's power in creation and redemption. Do we start there with what God has done and promised? Or do we quickly look for a human solution as humanists? In all practicality, many, many believers around the world, the globe, are humanists. They're practical humanists that they don't trust God immediately and fully but they look for a person to solve their problem. Now, God will use people to solve our problems. He will work through them. But too often our shift is entirely toward some person fixing our problems, a plan that involves other people. God may work that out eventually, but our first call needs to be, God, I'm in a fix again. They're attacking me, God. What am I to do? And the other thing we commonly do, we are, practically speaking, we're materialists. We look for another, another object, something in technology to, to resolve our problems, a device of some sort to answer our questions. And again, technology is a wonderful thing. There are many advantages of it. But our first call is to be to God and his promises. Starting there, that's what makes us different. We turn first to God. The Israelites of old in the northern kingdom and southern as well turned, not to God immediately, but they schemed a plan. And rebellion happens very subtly as we exchange the promises of God and we set them aside and turn to some mechanism or some person for our survival and rescue. 
Beware of this subtle shift that is a form of rebellion. And secondly, rebellion happens as we exchange the power of God for the protection of man. Again, Lois will read this segment, a long passage in Isaiah chapter 30. But Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. Though they have officials in zone and their envoys have arrived in Hanes, everyone will be put to shame because of a people useless to them, who bring neither help nor advantage, but only shame and disgrace. An oracle concerning the animals of the Negev, though through a land of hardship and distress, of lions and lionesses, lionesses, of adders and darting snakes, the envoys carry their riches on donkeys' backs, their treasures on the humps of camels, to that unprofitable nation, to Egypt, whose help is utterly useless. Therefore, I call her Rahab, the do-nothing. Again, rebellion is a very subtle thing, not overt, not a scream, perhaps, not a fist in the face of God, but just exchanging the power of God. They had forgotten the power of God displayed against Egypt when the children of Israel went through the great Red Sea. The power it displayed through Moses and the plagues. The way God had kept them alive, sustained them with manna and quail in the wilderness. They forgot there was the mighty hand of God that delivered them out of Egypt. Now they turned to Egypt as if God had no power. And they looked to Egypt, their former foe, their weak human powers. And they trusted that. We'll exchange the power of God for the protection under the shadow of the Pharaoh's uh, and their marvelous architecture of the pyramids. We'll trust that, the protection of man. But as I, Isaiah said, that's not going to work for you. You're going the wrong direction. You say, how have we rebelled? Very subtly. We don't need God's word, his promises. We don't need his power. We will look to man as humanists to protect us. Surely that'll work. And as the Apostle Paul said, the time would come when men will not put, uh, put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. For the time will come when men will put up with that, without, not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Itching ears. In every generation, there are those who desire to hear certain things that make them feel good and right. Many churches around the globe now are about feel good. Tell me what I want to hear. Don't mention rebellion and sin. Don't point out to me my subtle ways of rejecting God setting aside his word. Don't tell me how I'm shifting my attention from the work of God and the power of God to the plans of man. Just make me feel good, itching ears. That is going on today. But we are to not rebel, repent of our rebellion and turn to God in all circumstances. Turn to him first. He and his creativity can do something direct. He and his creativity can use the technology, the people that surround us. But it is to God we put our confidence. We rebel when we start elsewhere and always have our own schemes for getting things done, especially when we're in a tight spot. So no itching ears designing our own, but go to God simply, quietly as a child in need. Look to him. Disasters result. Note what takes place. And again, if Lois would read from verses 3 through 5 of, again, we're going back a bit, but in this book of Isaiah chapter 30. But Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. 
Though they have officials in zone and their envoys have a arrived in Haines, everyone will be put to shame because of a people useless to them who bring neither help nor advantage, but only shame and disgrace. So that's the result. These large words I've given to you in the type shame, disgrace, shame, disgrace. That's what be the outcome of their rebellious, subtle rebellious ways, exchanging the promises of God for the plans of man, exchanging the power of God for the protection of man. They'd be embarrassed about the outcome. Shame and disgrace would be the result of their shift of confidence. Thirdly, rebellion happens ever so subtly when we exchange the truth of God for the talent of man. Again, if you'd read on from verse 8 to 11. Write it on a tablet for them, inscribe it on a scroll, that for the days to come it may be an everlasting witness. These are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, see no more visions, and to the prophets, give us no more vision of what is right. Tell us pleasant things, prophesy illusions. Leave this way, get off this path, and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. And simply continuing to read through verse 15. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, replied, relied on oppression, and depend on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall, crap, and bulging that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery, shattered so mercilessly that among its pieces not a fragment will be found for taking coals from a hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. And then uh, verse 15. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation, and quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. Powerful key verse that holds this text together. In repentance and trust is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But the rebellion of it all is that you'll have none of it. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. I'm going to ask this question a couple of times. Are you like the Israelites of old? You've heard about repentance and you don't like that word. We've talked about rest and these are your salvation. Quietness and trust we've talked about. They are your strength, but you push it aside, keep pushing it aside. Maybe even as a believer, you keep pushing aside the old ways that got you into the kingdom of God of repentance and rest. And you are looking to other kinds of strength that are not about trust and quietness. You keep pushing it aside. We read on and it says, therefore, you say, no, we'll flee on horses. That's part of the talent of Egypt. They were good horsemen. Therefore, you will flee, says the Lord. You said, we'll ride off on swift horses. We'll escape and run away. Therefore, your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you will all flee away till you are left like flagstaff on the mountaintops, like a banner on a hill. The Egyptians had great talent, wonderful people, their great horsemanship. That part of the world still provides some of the finest breeding animals, swift, powerful, warrior-type horses. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, 
who rely on horses, who will trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. Isaiah chapter 31 verse 1 spoke of these great animals. We will trust in the talent of the horses and the horsemen of Egypt. That's what we'll do rather than the truth of God. Egypt, 31 verses 2 and 3. Yet he who is wise and can bring disaster, he does not take back his words. He will rise up against the horse of the wicked, against those who help evildoers. Woe to the Egyptians, but to the Egyptians are men and not gods. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, he who helps will stumble. He who is helped will fall. Both will perish together. You trust Egypt, and what will happen is you're just trusting flesh, horse flesh, and not spirit. You will stumble together with your helper. Woe to the land of whirling wings along the rivers of Cush, which send which sends envoys by sea in papyrus boats over the water. Go, swift messengers, to a people tall and smooth-skinned, to a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech whose land is divided by rivers. Speaking of Egypt, that land. Years ago, I, I traveled to Israel and to Egypt and my father was with me and he noted right away that the people of Egypt were good looking, fine looking people. It's probably true to this day, the way that their faces are formed and so forth, they are attractive people. And so it may be easy to look to the talent and the attractiveness of other people. Surely we'll be saved by them. We live in a day when people have shifted their attention from the truth of God to the talent of man. And there are many television shows, at least in my country, in the United States, about talented individuals turning to them. And here we see the land of Egypt and no doubt the rivers and so forth. But uh, we have a disastrous result when this happens, when we shift our attention from the truth of God to the talent of man. Lois, if you go on, verses 12, and 14. We've read them once, but for emphasis, let's read them again. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, relied on oppression, and depend on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging, that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery, shattered so mercilessly that among its pieces not a fragment will be found for taking coals from a hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. And the disastrous results are stated. The sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging. It collapses suddenly in an instance. It will break in pieces like pottery, shattered so mercilessly that among its pieces not a fragment will be found for taking coal from the hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five you will all flee away till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. Destruction and defeat are the result.